I hope that you have enjoyed the live refreshment and you have mingled around to get more training ideas. But the best is for the last, as I believe the majority of us are actually actively trading in the local market. Up next, we shall continue with our next presentation on Malaysia market outlook. Our next speaker, Mr. Chan Ken Yu, is the head of research of Kananga Investment Bank, Rahat. Can you host a Master of Finance from RMIT University of Australia and a Master of Economics from University of Malaya? Being the head of research, he is the chief strategist of Kananga Research, analyzing the overall equity market direction and macroeconomic condition. In 2009, Kenyu was ranked the top three banking analyst in Pan Asia as well as the top 10 overall stock picker in Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, please put our hands together to welcome Mr. Chan Ken Yu. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for the uh, kind introductions. Okay, uh, suppose uh, our second quarter investment strategy review. Uh, why the call review? Because our report haven't really issued yet, so I can only call it review. Uh, but uh, in the national most of our review, uh, I think uh, even if I issue the strategy report, will be mostly uh, unchanged. And uh, before I talk about my uh, market outlook and strategy, uh, probably just have a quick uh, glance at the Malaysian economy. Uh, what we think about the uh, economy growth. Uh, our economists still believe that the growth uh, will reach a range from 5 to 5.5. 5. I think uh, off late, if you read the Bank of Nagara governor uh, uh, speech, I think uh, they uh, widened their forecast uh, to about 4.5 four, uh, four to 5.5% kind of growth uh, from uh, 5 to 5.5. Uh, 5. So the widened growth also implies that. Uh, uh, the uncertainties uh, are there in the economy, uh, I mean, in the global economy and also the local side. But uh, I was uh, on, I mean, in Kananga, uh, we still think that the growth is still in there, uh, mainly driven by uh, the private investment, uh, mainly the TP related and also the uh, export driven. Uh, often, if you notice, I think our export numbers uh, after the regular weekend. Uh, used to be at the single digit kind of growth now, we are actually at the low teen. So, uh, with the uh, slight weakening in the ringgit, uh, therefore, I think that should benefit our uh, export uh, sector. Uh, consolidation uh, in the fiscal position, definitely, I think uh, that one uh, is actually ongoing. Uh, and going forward, I think uh, the, the drive from the, uh, uh, we we'll say, EDP project still uh, have to come in up from. The uh, private investment side, not so much on the government, but I think the major project like the uh, MRT, uh, definitely I think is uh, is uh, ongoing. Uh, they can't actually cut down. Uh, uh, I mean the, the mega project in a very big way. Uh, inflation, uh, we are looking uh, at about I think three percent in uh, FY14. I think uh, FY15 probably I think uh, inflation will be slightly higher because of the uh, uh, potential. GSC implementation. Um, interest rate, even I think with the uh, hike in uh, uh, inflation, uh, we still think that the interest rate will still remain unchanged and the OPR will uh, remain flat at 3%. Uh, the reason why uh, we think so is because uh, Malaysia is not an inflation targeting, uh, uh, I would say, the uh, uh, nation. And uh, I think uh, uh, we actually emphasize more on growth uh, compared with the and uh, with the higher living costs, uh, I think uh, th there is uh, no reason for Ben and Nara to uh, increase their interest rate. Of course, I think uh, there are very slim chance uh, interest rate will uh, be raised uh, if uh, the inflation is uh, much higher than expected, or uh, we, we see a very strong outflow of uh, foreign funds. Uh, I think. Uh, this is pretty much hinged on the U.S. side. Uh, if let's say the U.S. Uh, next year they, they really uh, go for uh, interest rate hike, uh, we potentially we see uh, a, a, a series of outflow of foreign funds back to the U.S. 
and therefore I think uh, Ringgit will uh, be very well time, uh, even though I think in the long run uh, we should see strengthening in Ringgit because once you have the uh, uh, GSD being uh, implemented, uh, that means to say our physical position uh, should improve from here and uh, with the uh, conservation in, in our physical position, uh, there's no reason uh, the Ringgit will weaken. Uh, of course, I think the, the, the problem right now, I think the uh, uh, foreign investor group, uh, Malaysia, together with other uh, emerging economy in the same basket. And uh, I think with the recent uncertainty in Thailand and, uh, and uh, I think uh, in Indonesia, uh, they actually, we, we, we saw uh, some selling uh, from the foreign uh, investor. And therefore, I think the, uh, the ranking actually weakened quite substantially recently. Uh, we also, I think, revised down our uh, ringgit forecast. Uh, we used to have a 309 uh, yen target for ringgit. Now we revised down to uh, 321. Average ringgit forecast for this year uh, also revised down to uh, 325 over one US dollar. Now during earlier in the year, um, we said that uh, uh, we will still continue to see a quite decent growth.
started to a certain extent is uh, a bit of a disappointment. Uh, notice I think you know in South season. Uh, but again, I think the liquidity uh, on the domestic side, I think it's still pretty really strong. If you check uh, with the uh, foreign outflow, I think the gray line that, that represents the uh, this gray line that is a community uh, foreign position in the market. I think uh, you can see the foreigner obviously uh, the major seller in our market, uh, but the, uh, the index are holding pretty well. That is because of the local side uh, supporting the, the market. Now, um, can it be sustained? Um, I think if you look at the access liquidity in the banking system, it had uh, came down from a 330 billion access liquidity to about 290 recently, I think uh, off by 30 billion. So is that a uh, worrying sign? Now we look at the historical. Uh, that is the uh, access liquidity during the global financial crisis. Uh, the access liquidity actually drained by about 100 billion back then. And uh, we saw the index. Uh, the index is actually represented by this dark line here and uh, access liquidity is a big line. And uh, we saw the market actually corrected uh, after the access liquidity dip or I think declined by about 100 billion. Uh, there was a time our access liquidity also contracted by about 50 billion. But market back then uh, still really, I would say, the supportive. Uh, that means it mean from this historical, we, we can roughly make a conclusion. Uh, we can roughly just uh, make a simple uh, conclusion saying that so long if the uh, liquidity drain is not more than 50 billion, uh, we are quite safe. And uh, recently, uh, liquidity actually came down by about 30 billion. Uh, so, I would say it's still pretty manageable uh, in the, in, from a liquidity standpoint. And uh, don't forget that uh, during the uh, this area, during the uh, private crisis, our uh, uh, total market cap back then I think is no more than one point two trillion. And uh, that means to say your uh, free float market cap uh, should actually less than three hundred billion. Uh, 300, uh, yeah, 300 billion and uh, the 100 billion did in excess uh, represented about the one third but now your market cap is more than total market cap is now more than 1.4 uh, trillion uh, okay. so as a percentage 30 billion to the um, excess liquidity about I think more than 360 billion uh, percentage is much uh, lesser so therefore, we think that the local liquidity uh, will still be the uh, main supporting factor for the local market. And if uh, the foreigner continues to sell now, I think, uh, you, I think uh, there's some uh, market observer uh, very concerned about the uh, foreign holding in our bond market. Uh, they said that I think the foreign holding in the bond market is actually at a historical high. And uh, if they start to sell down in our local bond market, that actually, uh, I would say, the tempered our equity market. Now, uh, the foreigner, I think, in tandem with the recent outflow of uh, foreign funds in the equity market, also, uh, they did uh, foreign uh, holding in the bond used to be about 32%. Uh, now, actually, they did slightly below 28 uh, In terms of absolute term, uh, they did about uh, 7 billion. Now, uh, if you look, if you uh, believe, let's say uh, the foreigner uh, uh, continue to sell down uh, the, uh, the, the bond and uh, do the historical low about, I think that is about 20, starting about 21, 22 uh, percent of the uh, uh, historical low uh, holdings. That means to say we will see a potential uh, outflow or I think drain in excess liquidity about 34 billion. And uh, together with 
the decline of the DP rent right now, that means to say we potentially see a decline in excess of about 64. Uh, in terms of uh, percentage wise, I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's, I think I would say it's uh, at the borderline case, but uh, it looks like we still uh, manage the, to weather such situation. Unless the uh, foreign shareholding actually uh, or the foreign outflow is actually larger than expected. Because uh, if they really go down to the historical low here, we will see as much as about 74 uh, billion outflow in the foreign fund, which I think uh, it will not be the case. But again, who knows? Uh, in the second half, as I said, I think the, the problem is lies with, uh, I mean, lies with the US uh, monetary. Uh, policy decision. So in the second half, things are uh, going to be more challenging compared with the uh, first half. <coughs> and so the investment strategy we, we adopt here is plain simple. Uh, for first half, we still think that buying on weakness is an appropriate strategy. We will go uh, with the trend. Uh, ideal buying level uh, will be about slightly below 1775. Uh, that is actually about 6% discount uh, to the consensus target price, about 1,940. Uh, because of the market actually recently actually corrected to that level and uh, stabilized around here, uh, we think that this is a good time for us to start deeper uh, into the stock and the position uh, for, uh, say, the uh, uh, upswing again before uh, uh, things become more uncertain in the second half. Uh, but again, of course, I think uh, uh, given the, the sector outlooks are quite uh, mixed, uh, we have to be very selective in our uh, stock picking. Uh, in terms of sectors, uh, apart from the world sectors, overweight sectors that we, we uh, spell here, uh, we want to focus more on the uh, export-oriented sectors. Uh, as we said, I think the weakening of breaking uh, could potentially benefit them. And, uh, if you look at the, even in the recent shipping uh, sectors, the uh, red box index also start to turn around. And uh, that uh, is actually quite in line with the uh, recovery uh, in the uh, global economy. Um, based on our simulation also, uh, it looks like the risk reports still favor the upside. Uh, the chances for CI to move beyond 1890, that is our year and uh, fair value. Uh, is as high as I think uh, close to 50%. So we have uh, quite a strong chance to see the CI move uh, beyond uh, our family, year and family. In fact, once you roll over to next year, uh, we, our fair value will be even higher, about uh, 2010. And uh, if you just take a simple, simple average, that means to say uh, CI potentially should move up to uh, high about 1950. Uh, So um, in terms of uh, stock picks, we have a uh, uh, few stocks here. Uh, obviously, I think uh, I will say we want to focus more on the export-oriented sectors. Uh, we actually have map up uh, as a proxy to the shipping uh, sectors. We have an MPI to leverage on the E and E, uh, and we have uh, Supermax uh, to uh, represent the. Uh, the glove sector as well. These three sectors are mainly export driven. And uh, these names like Harbor, like uh, PIE, Pi, uh, all those are slightly in a smaller cap, uh, which I think uh, sometimes we cover uh, in our, on our radar, the, uh, tr the, the trading product, uh, which we think is still uh, uh, fair or give you a quite of good uh, investment opportunity. Uh, EPP related, we are still looking at construction and oil and gas. Uh, in fact, I think uh, among all the uh, sectors, we still think that oil and gas sectors give you uh, the best uh, earning facility and uh, in terms of uh, uh, use growth. Uh, therefore, we have two uh, companies uh, in uh, this category. We have Dialog, that is to, uh, to leverage uh, in the uh, rapid Coastal uh, contract, I think very recently they start to change business model. It used to be a shipbuilder, uh, earnings very lumpy, uh, 
JDI a very low PE. I think uh, only about five times, six times PE per pop because the uh, earnings are lumpy. Uh, but now things are different. They yeah, start venturing oil and gas. They want to become the asset owner. Uh, they just bought a contract, a gas free contract, and uh, just done a prior placement and um, expecting to get another uh, checkup ring contract as well. So once you become an asset owner, um, they are not an operator, they will rent out or lease out their asset to uh, operator and uh, it's something like a, a, a correcting rental from them and uh, they will have a more recurring income compared with the uh, lumpy uh, earning in the past. So therefore, in this kind of uh, um, Say the situation, the yeah, uh, valuation should actually improve uh, because normally in a more recurring uh, income stream uh, market, we need to pay uh, higher valuation, a PE, at least in the PE multiple. Uh, now I think they are trading about 12 13 times PE. Uh, if you compare with the other oil and gas stocks, easily even the mid cap stocks, they are doing about 18, 17, 18 times they are So uh, this is one of the stocks we think that uh, relating. Uh, I would say the, uh, the story will be that <coughs> IJM is a proxy for uh, I think uh, the, the construction sector uh, also I think uh, they, apart from WCE uh, highway I think they are going to benefit from the MRT too I think obviously another one will be Kamuda uh, is another obvious uh, winner from the MRT2 uh, announcement I think cabinet already uh, approved so we are still waiting for the uh, news to come out uh, on the, the actual uh, route and the deadline. So the, I think in a couple of uh, next few months, we're going to see more uh, news route coming from the MLT side. Others uh, uh, stock pick from various sectors will be for banks. Uh, I would say that uh, we, we have two tier uh, investment strategy in the banks. I think, uh, no secret that banks now into the top lines, uh, growth is going to be moderating, uh, then interest margin is going to squeeze further uh, because of co competitions. Uh, the cost is uh, still remain pretty sticky. Uh, provision most likely to, to increase from here because they are historical low. And uh, also, and recently we saw uh, that there are some, uh, I would say, the slight deterioration in. Asset quality and therefore the, the credit cost should actually uh, increase from here. Now, all these things not going to be uh, good for the banking sector. That's why I think that all the banking stocks now only trading at about 13 times PE the above on average. Uh, definitely, it's lesser compared with the CI. CI is now trading at about slightly less than 17. Uh, so, in this kind of sector, we only have two uh, strategies either you go for uh, the most defensive like public bank or you go for like gas and value like uh, RHB is one of them. The other one is uh, PIB. I think recently PIB the share price has been bashed down uh, because of the uh, new rules. I think the, the new rules in the uh, uh, Islamic uh, bank, uh, Islamic deposit taking uh, the Wadia and the Muharraba uh, uh, side. I think. I mean in the nutshell, uh, we think that this. Uh, change I think is overplayed. Uh, basically, I think uh, the, the changes only uh, means that, uh, uh, that the cost of the deposit taking is start, uh, getting higher slightly. Uh, marketing cost also getting uh, uh, higher, uh, and your deposit growth uh, potentially will become slower. And all those we already factor in into our forecast, and uh, we still see prospect, uh, good prospect for EIB, only because of the substantial reduction in the uh, minority interest. After uh, the completion of the 49% acquisition uh, of the Bank Islam State from uh, Tamil Haji and uh, Dubai uh, party, I think the, uh, the BIMB the earnings will still uh, be improved because of the uh, minority uh, reduction. And uh, we actually factor all this in, we actually factor in the uh, right issue uh, and large share cap, all this stuff. Uh, even the ROE from uh, used to be about uh, high, I mean high 20s to only about 17 now. Uh, it's still, we still think that the value will still be there after the correction. Uh, at our target price, 
we only look at about uh, I think less than 15 times PE, I think it's about 13 odd times PE. So it's still uh, in line with the market average. So uh, these two stocks, uh, to us, I think uh, they have more value uh, compared with other banking stocks. Uh, others, we have uh, uh, some way, uh, it used to be a, a proxy to a property, but I guess uh, they also will benefit from the MRT uh, line too as well. I think going forward, their development will uh, focus more on the MRT line. The uh, other, I think definitely is a tariff uh, revision. Uh, I think uh, even at our target price, we're looking at about 14 and a half times PE, uh, which is still below the uh, CI average. And uh, IOI uh, is one of the most efficient uh, integrated uh, online player. Um, but therefore, I think uh, even in terms of valuation, we think that uh, uh, they will continue to improve after the spin of the property arms. I mean, recall, I think uh, it used to be one of the darling stocks, uh, but after they took uh, uh, IOI property private, uh, we saw some derating uh, because market uh, not really uh, look at them as a pure uh, plantation player. And uh, KLK, the valuation since then have been improved. Uh, but I think uh, with the spin off of IOI property, uh, things will actually reverse. Uh, their PE valuation will, uh, will start. Uh, in the telcos, we don't have a, a, a topic within the telco, uh, the telco sectors. We used to have a TM as our topic, uh, but uh, in this quarter we took it out because of the recent announcement. Uh, TM actually acquired uh, P1 State. Uh, I think the uh, initial capex uh, will be high, uh, and uh, I think we are actually lacking of uh, uh, details and information uh, over the uh, synergies. Therefore, I think uh, for this quarter, we temporarily took it out. Uh, but if you really uh, uh, want to expose in uh, these telco uh, sectors, uh, I think the next preferred one will be DG. Uh, but again, I think valuation is nothing fantastic. Uh, the one will give you better valuations, I think, uh, probably in a smaller category like uh, Rayton. Uh, I think uh, this is a, a turning around company. Uh, used to have lost banking, but now I think in the past few quarters they actually reported quite a good set of earnings. Uh, after they actually tie with Maxis, they at least their yeah, spectrum to Maxis every year uh, they will receive about 30 to 35 million uh, from Maxis. And uh, they are also a cash rich company right now. I think they have about uh, close to 50 million uh, cash equivalent to about uh, 7 cents per share uh, kind of cash uh, from now on. Uh, even if you look at uh, our target price, only represent about 14 and a half time PE. So if you take out the cash portion, um, it's only uh, about 13 times the amount. So variation is still uh, undemanding uh, in our view. So uh, this will be the few names uh, we have uh, for this quarter. Uh, with that, I think uh, I'm going to end my presentation here. Now, uh, before I end, uh, probably just a little bit of commercial time. Uh, I think we for those who are familiar with our products, we have a, a one product called on our radar and uh, on our portfolio. I think uh, these two products are mainly designed for retail investors. Uh, if you are clients, uh, I mean, if you want to know more about our uh, smaller cap uh, calls, I mean, these two products are uh, specially uh, tailored for, for you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, can you? Well, uh, like what uh, can you has mentioned, uh, the research model portfolio that Kanana Research Team has developed, it is actually made available in our Cantrade portal. You just have to log in into Cantrade, and at the top menu, there's actually a research menu item whereby you can actually access the research articles from there. Now we, uh, we shall move on to the panel Q&A session and uh, we would like to invite once again our speakers, uh, Mr. Eli and uh, Ken Yu to come on stage uh, to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Meanwhile, again, uh, we appreciate that each and every one of you will spend some time to fill up the feedback form 
that we can place on your seat. It will be extremely helpful to us so that we can plan our next seminar that could tailor to your needs. There are so much things going on around the world today, a lot of uncertainties and so forth. What will be the potential that is one with the mouth? Uh, presume the, uh, the question directed to me. <laughs> uh, okay, I think uh, from our end, I think the, uh, uh, the, I would say, the inflection point or turning point of the come. When the US start to increase the interest rate, I think the repercussion uh, to not only Malaysia, I think to the entire world, uh, probably I think uh, uh, will be uh, quite great. Of course, now you have uh, Ukraine, you, know, you have uh, uh, China, Bubble, uh, all those things. Uh, but I think the interest rate uh, will, will have a wider, uh, I would say, the because uh, that will actually cause a massive flow uh, of uh, foreign capital and uh, most likely I think the capital will actually pull off from uh, this part of the world uh, to back to the US and I think what we actually worry is if the outflow is too massive that probably I think that will hit uh, the market I think uh, just want to show you the liquidity study uh, if let's say the, the outflow is too huge we might see a uh, sharp correction in the local market. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are three uh, potential black swans uh, that we are confronting today. The first is the, a liquidity crisis in China uh, caused by uh, you know, the, the credit markets. I'm not even sure it's a black swan anymore because uh, you know, the black swan refers to highly unlikely economy. But if you look at you know, ICBC, you look at Banker, uh, the traditional uh, blue chips such as Pingan, the market is pricing a very high likelihood of a credit crisis in China in my view over the next 12 months. Uh, that's one sort of a potential source of massive downside in the equity markets in Asia. Uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, what was said earlier. Then the risk also lies in the US. The two other risks I see is again similar to what I said earlier, when the US raised rates, the capital flow will flow back to the US in search of a stronger dollar and also obviously a stronger economy as well. And how will that impact emerging markets, that sudden outflow? Actually we've seen a taste of that. We had a taste of that in June last year. Uh, and Luckily, uh, you know, that stopped after some time, uh, but we can see that the impact of equity markets can be tremendous. And finally, this I think is the largest uh, black swan, highly unlikely but likely catastrophic effect is that if we see a recovery in the US that's stronger than anticipated in terms of magnitude and speed, then to prevent excessive inflation uh, that's, that could occur, the Fed will be forced to raise interest rates much faster and much higher than we thought. And we've seen that 
come into play, I think, the last time, probably as far back as the 80s, when Paul Walker was the Fed chairman, where he was forced to raise rates as high as about 10% to stop the inflation expectation. So really a function of the amount of money that they printed and a very strong economy coming on the back of that and they may have to raise interest rates significantly to stop uh, excessive inflation in the US. That will obviously uh, bring about massive second and third derivative impacts. <clears throat> but like I said, I think that is a black swan that is highly, highly unlikely with a potential catastrophic implication in the world markets. Any other questions? Yeah. My question is to both speakers, okay? Japan is going to increase the sales tax. And the uh, RP is the third arrow, I haven't seen it. I'm not mistaken. What will be happening to Japan stock market? And what will be its impact? to Malaysia and Singapore? Uh, um, your question is to uh, the impact of uh, economy in, uh, in Japan to Malaysia or are they not effective or anything? Uh, what what is the, the, the main question will be? Build up debt. 
in a way, uh, building up physical debt to finance growth in the economy. Now, this can only happen to a certain extent, and to prevent a potential blow up, they need to do two major things. Now, if you know that if you own money, the easiest way to pay off that debt is to print more money to devalue your debt. Uh, I'm not saying that the Japanese are doing that, but they are injecting excessive liquidity into the market by increasing their monetary base. This obviously helps them to pay off their existing debt. Now, to create, a, to create credibility that they are not defacing their debt, they have to uh, implement measures, the debt arrow that you spoke about, to show that they are actually fiscally responsible. They have to raise taxes, to increase their revenue side of things, to show a, you know, a consistent plan that they, are, they have a fiscally responsible policy to make sure that their uh, you know, debt structure is sustainable over the longer term. I think this could work out one or two ways, let's almost say nothing. It could work out extremely well. They have to uh, kickstart the economy again, get inflation up, get savings levels down, get their corporates to dissuade more and to uh, buy more equities instead of uh, bonds. And I think this, this is the base scenario that their plan will turn out well, but if, uh, you know, in a very small chance, which is the, the four lessons that I spoke of, in a very small chance that, you know, credibility and physical faith in the Japanese yen and their debt is destroyed because they cannot project, uh, you know, a, a credible plan for fiscal responsibility and fiscal debt plan for the economy in the long term, then we could see something catastrophic happen in Japan. Uh, we could, it's a very small chance of black swan in my view, but then again, you know, there are funds out there just betting on a, a, a bus in Japan. There are funds out there just primarily betting against the yen, there are funds out there just buying uh, Japanese CDS. Uh, I think Jeffrey Gunlock was a famous uh, fund manager in the US, publicly come out to say that he wouldn't be surprised if the yen trades at 200 to the US in a couple of years. So, so on and so forth. Uh, the other people betting, betting on their last one event. And what's the impact in Asia? I think I, I agree uh, with what I said earlier. The direct ties uh, while there is this the uh, while, while the direct ties are there, the immediate impact uh, is likely to be minimal because people are still more focused on growth in ASEAN, uh, focused on growth in Southeast Asia, they're still wanting to commodity story, underlying growth, uh, and also economic stability. Uh, so we would see a heavy direct impact only in the event of a crisis scenario as I spoke about earlier. Other than that, uh, we don't see that you know, being a key driver in the equities market in the next one to two years. It's interesting that uh, we have a supermax target 380 that's almost 30% upside. While other research houses, they are putting a neutral, giving the backdrop of the urban rationalization of natural gases, electricity, minimum wage, so forth and so forth. And at the same time, there will be excess capacity in the nitrate blur, where supermax is going more in the way compared to its peers. So, what's your take on this? Why is it 30% higher? Now, I think uh, for the glove sectors, uh, we still pretty positive. Uh, I think uh, the one thing we want to address is the over capacity or oversupply issue. I think a lot of people actually misunderstand in their, in their sense. Now, the, if you read it from all the newspapers, they told you they want to expand uh, X amount of capacity expansions. But uh, you have to be aware that all this expansion normally is come in a five years kind of time frame. And normally I think uh, they will implement in stages. That means to say, let's say, uh, if they say, I want to expand, let's say, 5B of uh, additional capacity, it's not that one year you will have a 5 billion uh, car of additional capacity. The chances are they will normally phase out in, uh, 
let's say two or three phases, and maybe one phases will take at least one to one and a half year to complete. And if if that's the case, the oversupply issue, uh, to be to to be frank, is overplayed because we also work out on the demand side. Every year, the glove demand in terms of number of pieces, the growth is about 12 to 15 percent. If let's say over five years, you will probably see more than six percent growth in volume. And if that's the case, your supply and demand dynamic will still be tape. That's number one. In terms of cost, I think we already saw uh, the petrol subsidy cut, I think back in 2010 or 2007. I think that there's one time our petrol prices came up to 270 per liter. I think they cut the subsidy. Uh, I think that time, glove industry also experienced the same thing. The gas price back then also spiked, but they are able to pass on to customers simply because we still uh, command the, the, the market premium. We still uh, are the largest glove manufacturer in the world, command about more than 60% of the whole market share. And uh, all this can be passed down. Of course, there are some time lag. Normally, it's about one to one and a half month kind of time lag in terms of pass down in cost. But again, there's a very good chance for them to pass down. So uh, for us, I think the, the, the cost side, uh, we understand for all the players, they're already pricing into their new pricing. And uh, don't forget that the technologies are uh, improved uh, very fast. Take for instance your Nitra curve. A few years ago, your thinnest nitro glove in the market, I think it's about 3.5, 3.4 gram per piece. Now, the thinnest you can go is about 3 gram. That means to say, your cost saving in your raw material is much larger than your cost increase in your energy cost. So that is the technology know-how we have here. And that gives us the advantage to pass down the cost. Although not full cost, but at least even the partially passed down to the glove player, they are still okay. Because their yeah, raw material cost also came down in Canada. So they are pretty really safe. For Supermax in particular, uh, why we pick them as a topic is mainly because of valuations. Now they are trading at below 12 times PE. Uh, in terms of earning space, yeah, of par with cost and rubber. And I think for some rubber, it's a trading above 15 times PE. Uh, therefore, I think we see the gap should actually get narrow. And uh, if you compare with the Hata and Top Glove, uh, why we don't think pick Hata in the sense because Hata all the while is well known for my trunk growth. Uh, so from now on, I mean, they have no additional, I mean, the, uh, the growth driver from here. And because of other players, all starting uh, in the nitro club, therefore their premium and command is getting lesser. So in the recent result, in fact, in the past few quarters, their margin always uh, under pressure. That is because the pricing power is not as strong as before because other players start catching up. And uh, for top club, we don't really think is because their market segment is slightly different than in the latex club segment. That glove is a tough segment because the trend is going for nitro. Although they want to uh, start with the nitro and grow the nitro glove segment, but again, the percentage of nitro glove to their product mix is very low. I think only about 10% count of, uh, of, I mean, in terms of volume coming from nitro. Also, I think very recently, the, 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 the hiccups in the China side, I think the, the vinyl growth also. Uh, then there's some heat up. So, so top glove is not our preferred, uh, uh, I would say, the peaks within the sectors. And the most important, their product is lower end, they are not medical grade. Once they are not medical grade, you are likely to uh, face more competition. I think, off late, the, the entire glove sectors actually uh, saw some pressure coming from top glove. I think that after the down result, they uh, I think uh, they said, no, it's a tough industry now, industry is seeing a very strong competition. So 
everybody thought that it's another sector, but look at their market segment, I think they, this kind of competition is already expected long time ago. So we have to be very selective in our stopping. And therefore, I think uh, we only pick uh, either Corsan or Supermax in the sense. Yeah. So in top valuation, we have uh, uh, Supermax as our topic. Corsan, I think we, uh, we call it, I think uh, for, for the past five quarters, really, I think the valuation already there. Although they still have a chance to grow, but I think uh, in the upside, probably Supermax will offer you better upside. Due to time constraint, uh, I think on behalf of all the audience, uh, I would like to invite our speakers to give us a wrap up as we usher into the second quarter of 2014. What and what should traders be looking out for? Maybe we start from uh, Eli first. Well, for the Singapore market, I think there are a few uh, key drivers in terms of the general direction. Uh, one, as we spoke about earlier, is the outcome of the credit situation in China. That's driven equities in China now significantly, and for even SGX stocks with us, Chinese exposure. So I think we will see the resolution of that likely over the next 12 months that will drive either a release in value for the source of Chinese exposure or some kind of uh, credit impact that will have uh, big implications for the region. The second external group of drivers that are coming from the West, clearly from the US, uh, how the US economy is growing and how the Fed responds to that will be key uh, to positioning your portfolio ahead. But that said, underlying you know, uh, these two set of macro factors, over the longer term, it is key uh, to look at the intrinsic sources of growth and economic stability in the region that we have. Uh, Indonesia is uh, expected to see very, grow very strong economic growth ahead due to the you know, population growth, growth in the middle class, uh, the demographics. Uh, Singapore, again, expected to be stability, population growth, uh, and in Malaysia, very, uh, you know, similar case as well. So, I would position myself according to my view of what's happening in China, my view of how the economy in the US is going to play out, and it's important to stay in the game, uh, so to speak, because I think the outlook for the region is still positive over the longer term. So no matter whether you are a trader or whether uh, you are a long-term investor with a stable diversified portfolio, it's essential to stay in the game. Um, for the local market, I think uh, I would emphasize more on Uh, that we have, I think, uh, so far the market is supported by domestic liquidity. So uh, that will be one of the very key uh, factors that I'm looking at. Uh, again, I think uh, should we see uh, stronger outflow of foreign funds than uh, we saw, let's say, excess liquidity contracted uh, in a substantial uh, way, then we have to be more cautious. Uh, also, I think uh, in the next uh, coming quarter result, also I think uh, we want to see whether uh, the, uh, the, the the corporate able to withstand uh, the recent weakness in the domestic, uh, I would say the uh, uh, domestic consumption. When all the while domestic consumption has been the uh, pillar of economic uh, growth for Malaysia, and uh, because of the uh, inflation. Because of the cut in the subsidies uh, and also potential implement GST, we want to see whether uh, the consumer spending pattern uh, change or not or slow down significantly or not. 
one step happens, I think uh, that probably will hurt our learning growth, uh, and uh, therefore also uh, impact the uh, market outlook. Um, in terms of uh, interest rate, uh, I would say I think uh, we have better certainty in the first half, and therefore I think uh, any weakness in the first half uh, could represent a good opportunity for us to position ourselves because at least you know the liquidity is still uh, there to back us up to support the market. But coming to the second half, uh, because of the uh, uncertainty, I will uh, I will say that I will opt more for some strength kind of strategy. I will become more trading oriented in the second, uh, second half, especially in August. Uh, for the past few years, August may have been a very bad month. So somehow something will come up during August. I don't, know, I don't know why, but it still <laughs> came out for, I think for the last three years really. So that is the, the month you want to watch out for. Maybe perhaps it's the Luna side of the month from the China side. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you once again uh, to our speaker, Eli, and thank you, can you, ladies and gentlemen, once again, our final round of applause to our speakers. It has been a wonderful session. On behalf of another investment bank, we hope that the seminar has been beneficial to all of you. And lastly, we urge those who have not yet become Kanana's client, kindly receive our booth out there. Our friendly dealers will be happy to assist to answer any of your queries. And also for those who need to validate your parking ticket, please proceed to the coffee kiosk. Our staff will be more than happy to assist you to validate your parking ticket. So, thank you ladies and gentlemen and have a great weekend and have a good investment training uh, period in the Q2 of 2014. Thank you, goodbye.